On behalf of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs and the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, I'm delighted to welcome you to this inaugural dialogue on the role of the investor venture capital community in achieving more equitable and sustainable societies. We are recording this event. We welcome you to turn on your video and update your name organization country if you like. While we'll hear from inspiring leaders from venture capital, academia, UN, and civil society today, we have planned significant time for interactive dialogue. Co-conveners of the event include Ulu Ventures, a top seed venture capital fund from Silicon Valley, the United Nations Joint SDG Fund, Stanford Angels of the UK, Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs of Texas, Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs of Southern California, whose co-founder Keith Coleman is joining us, and Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs India, whose co-founder Paula Mariwala is also joining us today. I am Radhika Shah, co-president of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs, an advisor to the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, and one of these events organizers along with Kristen Dobson and uh, Danny Raymond of the Resource Center. I'm also a tech impact investor and advisor to Illumin Capital, a fund of impact funds focused on reducing investment ecosystem bias. Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs is a Stanford community of over 2000 students, faculty and alumna, several of whom are investors from Silicon Valley, come together to advance entrepreneurship and innovation to help our society and the Stanford community. We'll hear from the group's inspiring co-founder Miriam Rivera today. With my hat of advisor to the Sustainable Development Goals Philanthropy Platform, I want to share some context on the Sustainable Development Goals. These goals ratified by most world leaders in 2015 offer us a global normative framework for collaboration to tackle the grand challenges of our times including climate change, inequality, poverty, hunger, health, education, livelihood for all, sustainable production and consumption, social justice, and more. Having grown up in the backdrop of the Gandhi ashram, to me, the SDGs and the spirit of leaving no one behind enshrined the Gandhian philosophy of respecting the dignity of each human being and thinking of a relationship to nature as that of a custodian rather than nature as a resource to exploit. The SDGs are very ambitious. In this last decade of action, we'll have to do things differently. We need transformative innovation and mindset change in the echelons of power, such as the investment and tech industries. We live in the worst of times, but the triple challenge of the pandemic overlaid on the underlying crisis of climate change and inequality can make even the most optimist among us lose hope. And yet this could be the best of times. This same adversity has and can bring out the best in us making us recognize the interconnectedness of our well-being. While the pandemic has made us race into a digital age, it is making us think in unprecedented ways about how tech innovation can help society, how we can make tech more inclusive. For the first time, we are recognizing the immense harm from tech to our youth, to democracy, to human rights. Perhaps this is the moment to reimagine the role of the tech investor. Who better than the VC community to co-lead the change towards more equitable and just societies? An investor has tremendous ability to shift their ecosystem via funding, influencing, requiring portfolio companies to understand and mitigate negative externalities of the, to the environment, negative externalities of tech, funding diverse teams, funding inclusive tech innovation and sustainable models, embracing the international human rights framework. A recent catalytic Stanford research study, which is challenging the status quo and creating awareness around the racial bias in the investment industry in an example of such systems change via collaboration between investors and academics. I had the privilege of being part of this study along with Dr. Ashby Monk, Darren Dodson, MD Lumen Capital and academics. Asset allocators who are at the top of the financial ecosystem and allocate funds to fund managers such as venture capitalists were surveyed. We found strong evidence that race influenced asset allocators' um, allocation decisions. One shocking finding was that qualification and good track record of past returns of African-American fund managers did not seem to increase asset allocators' confidence in them. While for white fund managers, there was a clear correlation when they were qualified and had a good track record of returns. I'll share a link to a National Academy of Sciences paper on these findings. Now, I am delighted to welcome 
our special guest, Lisa Kurbia, head of secretariat of the new exciting United Nations Joint SDG Fund to bring in a global perspective. Lisa has deep experience in international developments and human rights. At the fund, she promotes partnerships with governments, organizations, private sector, and family offices. She implements innovative financing projects and designs legislative and development strategies to advance the SDGs. She has served at UNICEF in key roles in Kenya, Somalia, and Mozambique. I've enjoyed collaborating with Lisa, building bridges between the Stanford community and the UN across the world. Welcome, Lisa. Over to you. Thank you so much, Radhika. Such an honor to be here, and, and congratulations to you and all the organizers on this event. Um, colleagues, our world is struggling to crawl out of Omicron's grip. Um, we look out our window, we see the impacts both locally and globally. And COVID-19, when you think of the SDGs, is, is projecting a shortfall of upwards of $1.7 trillion after already an existing gap of, of $2.5 trillion. So as, as Radhika just said, it can be overwhelming to look at 2030, to look ahead to all that needs to be done. Um, but here at the United Nations, really, it's about putting the spotlight on the most vulnerable. And I'm really here today to, to really ensure that the least of, of what we might focus on is not forgotten. So a little bit of context. Um, we work in emerging markets and developing countries in fragile states, and 90 out of 122 countries are now in economic recession, many in, in what they call free fall. The virus has devastated their tourism, their manufacturing sectors. And at the same time, you know, the pandemic has put pressure on the flows from advanced economies, which often is how the grants and the relief projects are funded. Um, so how do we push the envelope within the UN? How do we challenge everyone to ask why a piece, a slice, a percentage of the estimated 50 trillion flowing into the ESG market, why can't that be targeted on the most vulnerable? Why can't we take the wisdom, the, the incredible agility um, of Silicon Valley, of venture capitalists, to really reflect and, and consider those without access to clean water, those who will never attend a classroom or don't have the benefit of a, of a democratically elected government to, to advocate and, and protect their rights and liberties. So, so inside the UN, the, the Joint SDG Fund is trying to answer that question. We're designed to be that VC firm within the UN um, to bridge the gap in the demand for capital in these most fragile states, in these most nascent of emerging markets and supply capital, which is currently from our generous member states and then merge it and blend it with, with venture capitalists like you. Um, we're currently capped at 300 million. So we're still very, very small relatively speaking. Um, and what we speak are our partners and allies to really join us in the war against injustice, against inequality, and really look at the next eight years as a, a turbocharging back on track to rescue the SDGs and really find the inroads um, towards net zero, um, you know, towards battling climate change and towards embracing multilateralism. And I'd just like to share two quick examples um, from how the fund operates. Um, just to give you a flavor of what we do. So the first one is in Fiji, a small island developing state um, where climate change literally is a global impact. Um, I have colleagues in Suva who can't insure their own homes anymore. The underwriters will no longer give them a policy on their family home because to the insurance companies, Suva is a write-off in about 10 years. Now, we saw what just happened to Tonga. We're, we're seeing very, very directly what's happening to small island developing states. We're trying to reverse that. We're trying to not only support the small and medium enterprises, but make sure that they're doing that sustainably so that the reef that can help regenerate and protect not only Fiji, but the, but the wider Pacific um, can be supported. It's an example. We de-risk it. Ours is the first 10 million. We take the first loss. The other 30, 40 million is, is crowded in around our money. And of course, we're working hand in hand with government to make that happen. Another example for those who, who are familiar with rural development of those health clinics that are 12 miles off the main road, who don't have the supplies and are often run by volunteer midwives, we're de-risking loans to midwives in rural Rwanda so they can not only lease, but they can manage and eventually own the clinic where they've often been working as volunteers uh, for decades. 
Um, so, so really exciting to see that impact, to see how a rural community can change when that midwife is empowered and is now hiring other midwives and training, you know, all of that organic community leadership that we always knew was there but didn't know how to connect. I think we're finding a little bit of that, that, that connectivity. And that's really what, what we would love to share with your community um, going forward. We would love to find ways to, to share how we want to bring more and more attention to these emerging markets and work together. So thank you so much. I'm here to listen, learn, and, and always available for any questions. So thank you, Radhika, back to you. Thank you, Lisa, for that inspiring uh, new and perspective and to share, share about the exciting new fund. Um, without further ado, we will now hear perspectives from three deeply inspiring and brilliant speakers as initial context setting before we get into the interactive part of our dialogue. I am delighted to introduce my mentor, friend, and colleague, Miriam Rivera, a deeply respected and inspiring venture capitalist and thought leader from the Stanford community and the world of Silicon Valley. Miriam is co-founder and CEO of Ulu Ventures, one of the top seed stage VC funds based in Silicon Valley. She's a former Stanford board trustee and honored with the Stanford medal awarded to fewer than 1% of alumna. Miriam is on the investment committee of the Acumen Fund America and was one of the first uh, women vice presidents and deputy general counsels in the early days of Google. She sits on the board of the Kaufman Foundation and is a co-founder and uh, board chair of Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs. She is an advisor to the Launch with GS Advisory Council, a Goldman Sachs initiative to reduce the investing gap for Black and Latino founders. Welcome, Miriam. Hi, good morning. Um, it's so exciting to see the interest in this uh, interdisciplinary kind of approach to thinking about uh, change. And for me, uh, I really never expected to work in venture capital, but then realized that it was actually an, a way to create change um, and change that I really wanted to see. Um, some of the ways in which um, Ulu Ventures uh, works with entrepreneurs is that one, we actually fund diverse entrepreneurs. Um, I don't know if people are aware, but in the United States over the last um, five or six years, there's only been uh, about 200 underrepresented minority founders who've received venture capital in the entire country. Um, and if you look at Europe um, in terms of uh, people of uh, African ancestry, it would probably be in the tens of entrepreneurs. Um, so the world really has not made capital available to entrepreneurs um, that could help make a difference. Uh, we see the same thing with women. Uh, in the United States, about 12% of venture capital dollars are invested in women-led companies. And that's in a community where um, women actually uh, exceed male educational attainment in the United States at both the master's and uh, the undergraduate levels. So we see that one, different problems are solved depending on what uh, who is funded. Um, and so a lot of the times, uh, for example, we have entrepreneurs that are interested in areas like uh, innovation in education and education technologies. Um, those have actually been really important during uh, the COVID pandemic, um, as we've seen people uh, turn to uh, video media for both education, uh, therapy, um, and other ways of managing uh, work uh, in, uh, in particular in more technologized industries, but wherever um, people have adopted technologies, it's allowed people to be able to continue working, continue to be able to provide for their families. And so we see those technologies as being uh, very pivotal. Um, a number of our companies also have um, uh, environmental impacts. Uh, for example, we, uh, just this week invested in a company that um, uh, produces a battery that doesn't use cobalt, um, which will help with um, reduction of uh, what gets left in our landfills when all of our technology devices um, end up there um, and also um, reduces uh, dependence on extraction of certain mineral minerals. 
um, in the world, which is one of the impacts that technology does have. So we think that a lot of uh, what companies like we can do is to change the sorts of things that receive investment, the people that receive investments, and the kinds of problems that are addressed through um, companies that get created. And I've been around long enough now to see that um, in so many ways, it's easier to create something new than it is to change existing uh, companies and the way that they do things. And so some of our companies, for example, Proterra is an electric uh, bus company that has now gone public in the United States, and that is proliferating the use of electric buses um, in areas uh, like, for example, Southern California that really suffered um, high rates of pollution, which have um, disparate impact on the health of uh, lower income communities. Uh, as I think we all know, a lot of the um, social issues that we experience in a country have um, so many uh, ways in which they interact with one another. So we um, don't allow people to uh, get mortgages in certain neighborhoods. We redline them out of certain communities. We build freeways closer to those lower income and uh, minority communities. They um, have more uh, need for public transportation. Therefore, their health effects are worse because they're breathing exhaust. Um, and so a lot of these things, um, it really does uh, depend on uh, where you can uh, start making change. And in this case, you know, just reducing the emissions altogether is one way that technology can help um, have better uh, Im impacts in those uh, communities that, that are experiencing those kinds of environmental social impacts. So it's been exciting to work in this field and Radhika um, through Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs has been a real leader um, in bringing together um, investors and uh, technologies that uh, support better environment, better education, uh, better social impacts. Thank you, Miriam, for inspiring remarks and um, the deep insights um, and for the, the perspective from Silicon Valley. You are one of the most kind of leading, um, diverse, including investors I've ever met and uh, just so thrilled to be with you here today. Um, our next speaker, Dr. Ashby Monk, is a brilliant academic entrepreneur and scholar. Ashby is executive director of the new research initiative at Stanford University on long-term investing. He is head of research at Adepar and has co-founded several companies that help investors make uh, better investment decisions. Some examples are Future Proof, Net Purpose, DATA, and long-term, uh, sorry, long-game savings. He's also an advisor in several uh, climate-focused companies. He co-authored the Technologize Investor, and he's a member of CFA Institute's Future of uh, Finance Advisory Council. It has been a privilege to collaborate with Dr. Monk on multiple fronts, including the research Stanford research study, where we examine the nature of bias in the investment ecosystem. Welcome, Ashby. Thank you so much, Radhika. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's, um, it's an honor to have a chance to talk a little bit about the work I'm doing in the space specifically um, taking on this, this project of creating a more equitable and, and sustainable society with my little lens, which as you pointed out, is this community of long-term investors. Um, the community of long-term investors as we define them are those investors that have distant liabilities that allow them to take a longer term view. Um, many of these organizations go by names such as pension funds, sovereign funds, endowments, family offices, insurance companies, where the nature of the promise that they make in terms of funding an old age retirement, funding a university, gives them a, a kind of permission to think about the world 10, 20, 100 years from now. The Canada Pension Plan on its website will tell you explicitly they take a 75 year view. Um, and, and so these organizations are fascinating in trying to think about what is the world we wanna leave um, 75 years from now for our grandchildren, our children, et cetera. Um, and, and ultimately I think, and this has been kind of my life work that if we can change how they invest, then we can improve the functioning of economic systems. We can remove bias, we can unlock potential, 
um, that's there, that's untapped, and we can avoid stressing our natural and social ecosystems unnecessarily. Improvement does mean change. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about changing how organizations like CalPERS and um, you know, Abu Dhabi Investment Authority and GIC, I'm talking about changing how they invest, but I'm also talking about Sonoma County retirement system and Contra Costa retirement system and you know, all of these little small asset owner investors in between. These organizations around the planet control around 150 trillion, with a T, trillion dollars. So this is a massive platform. It's actually the foundation of capitalism today. Most of the risk capital emerges out of these organizations. And so if we can change how they make decisions, if we can change how they think about their portfolio and the future of the world, then we can change the flow of capital and change the organizations that power capitalism. The first decade of my career, I spent trying to think about how we change the process of decision making, the governance, the investment committees, because these were process driven organizations, in large part because they lacked data, data capabilities. Over the last 10 years, the writing on the wall is quite clear. The future is data driven decision making. Um, the alternative data movement, the ESG movement, the impact movement. If you drill down into these movements, you will find data, data systems, analytics, and at the core, um, new technologies that are transforming decision-making. The world's biggest investors are shifting from a process-driven decision-making to a data-driven decision-making. And therein lies a really valuable opportunity for those of us in this ecosystem of technology and data to shift $150 trillion worth of capital to more equitable and sustainable investment strategies and portfolios. If we can begin to capture this ESG project, environment, social governance, we can help those asset owners develop a richer understanding of their portfolio. And when I say richer understanding, I mean understand your portfolio's location to be different from where you believe it to be. This is a very common thing in my world where an organization gets a richer, deeper understanding of their portfolio and they realize they are exposed to risks they might not have realized they were exposed to. With the ESG movement, we can then begin to help them understand that and shift. All this is to say with the 150 trillion in these organizations, venture capital is increasingly a part, a sliver of that 150 trillion. And ultimately, I think the VC community, sure, we can play a part in the measurement of ESG in portfolios. But I think the really exciting thing from my perspective is the opportunity as an industry to contribute to these new data driven companies. Data as a service is an emerging category in the investment landscape. Um, Radhika mentioned a few of the companies, whether it's net purpose, future proof, you know, uh, there's a whole bunch out there that are collecting facts, not just assigning ratings, which I would say is a little bit of a problem of ESG, collecting facts and measuring outcomes and delivering that into this community of long-term investors thereby providing those investors with a richer understanding of their portfolio. And that in turn unlocks capital for sustainability, for um, equity and things like that. And so that's the work I'm doing at Stanford and I'll be happy to um, take questions on that um, when we get to the Q&A. Back to you, Radhika. Thank you, Ashby, for that overall um, industry perspective and the long-term investor perspective um, and, um, and kind of how big and how much the power there is there. Really, really inspiring remarks. Uh, um, our next speaker is Phil Bloomer, um, the Inspiring Executive Director of the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. Earlier, Phil was Director of Campaigns and Policy at Oxfam on GB, where he led teams working across policy, advocacy programs, and campaigns on food justice, humanitarian protection, and assistance in conflict zones, and provision of essential health and education for all. 
Earlier, Phil worked in South America on human rights dimensions of business, including in food security, resource extraction, and business relations with public and private security in repressive environments. As an international advisor to the Resource Center, I have been very inspired by the impact of the work across the world and enjoy collaborating with Phil and the rest of the BHRRC team. Welcome, Phil. Thanks very much, Radhika. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to speak to you about human rights and the new agenda of environmental, social and governance investment or ESG, with a focus inevitably on this on venture capitalists and digital technology. From our perspective, obviously, everybody knows that new and emerging technologies have enormous emancipatory potential for our societies facilitating access to information services and an end to drudgery potentially. But we also know that they can really be used to strengthen repressive regimes, undermine civil liberties and, re and reinforce the kind of abuse of workers and communities that comes from that inequality that Ashby and Lisa and Mariam have spoken about. Venture capitalists are, are uniquely placed in some ways to make a positive impact early in the company or the product's uh, development. If venture capitalists make clear their expectations regarding the impact on people and planet to, the com to newer companies, these new tech companies can bake this much more into their DNA and start to advance uh, the sustainable development goals, human rights, and the fast and fair transition to clean energy futures that we need. Miriam talked about the need for that corporate culture to be set at the start, and I would really endorse that. Nevertheless, at, at the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre, where I work, we unfortunately track many allegations of human rights abuse that are associated with technologies, from bias in artificial intelligence resulting in discrimination to oppressive monitoring of workers and the use of spyware. Equally opportunities and risks are fast evolving for venture capitalists and they need to keep up with the ESG developments and the regulatory agenda. For instance, regarding ESG, you know, and the exciting movement that Ashby has just spoken about, um, Bloomberg already reports the rise and rise of, of ESG and it being potentially a third of global assets under management by 2025. Yet venture capitalists are still perceived as late comers and behind the curve on ESG. Now done right, this ESG agenda, when it's tied to international standards like the United Nations Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights, that those ESG assessments using the data that uh, Ashby was emphasizing can really enhance the impact on the sustainable development goals that Lisa was mentioning and the reduce the risk and reduce real risks for venture capitalists. But by ignoring human rights due diligence, many tech companies and their, and their investors are building significant financial regulatory and reputational risk. For an example of the big mess that can result, witness the global coverage of the UN report, which stated that Facebook had contributed to conditions for the genocidal acts against the Rohingya in Myanmar and the platform now faces compensation claims that are worth more than 150 billion uh, pounds. So alongside these ESG pressures and their opportunities, there are also important regulatory developments that will strengthen the first mover advantages for successful uh, venture capitalists that heed the regulatory risk and get ahead of that regulatory curve. The, United, the, the, the European Union, acts as a global standard setter. Look at GDPR and now the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. Europe is now developing artificial intelligence regulation and the Digital Services Act. Equally, the European Union is developing the Sustainable Corporate Governance Directive, which will demand demonstrable human rights and environmental due diligence from companies and investors, or they will face civil liabilities when things go wrong. And even the largest tech companies now feel they no longer have free reign. Witness Microsoft divesting from any vision and deciding that it will no longer take minority investments in any facial recognition uh, firms. 
And in November, of course, Meta made a partial retreat, at least from uh, facial recognition. Now, these shifts represent an opportunity for forward thinking venture capitalists who want to lead innovation that delivers societal benefit and a handsome return on investment. The new design criteria, they're not onerous. The ESG is not a massive onerous issue. Due diligence is not ma massively onerous, but qu key questions must be asked, which may involve, in some cases, little effort for some decisions, but they will involve substantial effort where there are real human rights risks to communities and workers or environmental risks. For instance, does the company have a public human rights policy that identifies human rights risks? Does the board enforce the company's human rights policy? Because most don't. And does the company conduct human rights impact assessments? And just to give a couple of examples from our own work with our partners on the due diligence for technologies with surveillance capabilities. For instance, what are the salient human rights issues associated with the new technology? And does the design of the company's technology incorporate a standard set of human rights safeguard and a kill switch in the event of misuse. So in conclusion, I'd just say, you know, venture capitalists have a golden opportunity to ensure that their investments meet the ESG and new regulatory criteria to contribute to an emancipatory future for mankind and avoid the dystopian one. The effort is not onerous and the first mover advantage is substantial in terms of reducing commercial risk, regulatory risk, and attracting the very best talent and the very best asset owners that Ashby was speaking about. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, for the inspiring remarks, uh, bringing in the human rights perspective, the policy, the regulatory, the technology. And thank you again for the amazing um, work of the, the Resource Center, bringing such positive change around the world. I would now like to invite my awesome co-organizer of this event, Kristen Dobson, who will be moderating the next interactive session of our event. As a quick intro, Kristen leads the technology and human rights program and co-leads the civic freedoms and human rights defenders program at the Business and Human Rights Resource Center. She also works part-time with the Hive Fund for Climate and Gender Justice and is a member of the technical um, um, advisory group for UNPRI's new collaborative stewardship initiative on social issues and human rights. Earlier, Kristen led the Human Rights Funders Network's research and policy program. Over to you, Kristen. Thank you so much, Radhika, and it's such a pleasure to be here with you all today. I really also want to thank Miriam, Ashvi, and Phil for your insightful comments and for sharing your expertise with us. Um, thank you for highlighting a number of things that I hope we'll delve into in the discussion, including the significant lack of diversity in who receives and can access VC funding, the shift to data-driven decision-making as being a huge opportunity in the investment space as well as the importance of human rights due diligence by investors, given the real human rights and environmental risks and harm that can be associated with the use of tech. We want this to be as interactive a discussion as possible. Um, given the Zoom format, we know we have some limitations, but we really welcome your questions and your insights based on your experience. We ask that when you share comments or questions that you be brief as we really want to hear from a diversity of voices and from as many people as possible. Also encourage you if you are able and comfortable to use your camera um, when you share. And in terms of how we'll proceed, we do have over 100 people on the call, but we want to hear your voice. So in that spirit, I'll ask if you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. So if you're unfamiliar with how to raise a hand on Zoom, you just click on the reactions tab on the bottom of the screen and there should be a raise hand option. And then if you would like to ask a question but prefer not to speak, you're also welcome to put a question in the chat. Feel free to direct questions to all of the speakers thus far or to specific people. And finally, when you speak, it would be really helpful if you could say both your name and institutional affiliation so that we can get a sense of who's in the room and we can start to get to know each other a little bit more. And so with that, we are open for discussion. Does anyone have any questions or comments they'd like to come in with?
if we don't have any comments yet uh, maybe um no. kristen will do it. how many otherwise i'll invite one of the co-conveners to get a comment yeah. i know yeah i uh, think we do have um our our first comment it, sorry was someone coming in okay then i'm gonna go to paloma paloma i see your hand raised please come in can't unmute myself. Okay. I think you're unmuted. Okay. okay, great. Awesome. Thanks. Um, thanks so much for hosting this. I think this is, you know, an extremely timely, incredibly important conversation. Um, my name is Paloma Munoz Quick. I lead um, BSR's work at the intersection of human rights and financial services. And I've been working in the field of business and human rights, focusing on investment, especially in tech, but across sectors. Um, in recent years. And I just wanted to kind of touch on the point that was raised around ESG data and perhaps also take a step back. And, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges in the work that I've found advising investors, including in public private markets, such as venture capital and private equity is um, the approach to assessing ESG data tends to focus exclusively on risks, financial risk, reputational risks. Um, without first going into an assessment of what are the real world impacts of this um, investment, of our investment activities on people and planet. Um, where there is an assessment of impact, it tends to be on positive impacts, right? So we're going to create an impact fund. We're going to see how we can contribute to the development and realization of health and X community or what have you, which is wonderful. Um, but quite frankly, it's a very different process that must be undertaken to identify, assess, and address the negative externalities of these investments on people. Um, and my sense is that within the venture capital community, um, guidance, information on this is quite limited, and the ESG data landscape in particular is not capturing that side. And, and this is the case even in public equities, right? Not just private and, and, and venture. So I guess it's a question, um, for um, um, his, Ashby, is that your name? I'm sorry, from um, one of the speakers. And I'm, yes, Ashby, yeah. Um, to just sort of, I'd love to hear from you a little bit as to how you think that the negative externalities side of things, both in terms of processes, um, but also in terms of outcome for people is indeed reflected in the ESG da data landscape because just my, my impression has been that it's not. So thanks. Great question. Um, I, I completely agree. So the ESG landscape today is filled with ratings and, and like to put a point on this um, in the public market space, um, Tesla, Rio Tinto and Apple all have the same Sustainalytics rating. And so what does that mean? Like, I, I don't know how that changes my decision making about any of those companies given that they, and, and it's often, kind of a black box of like what's going into those ratings. Um, and so I think a lot of what we need as, as, and this is kind of like the call to action for the venture capital community, which is like, we have the capacity to measure a lot of those outcomes you're talking about um, and getting towards facts and away from ratings, I think is a pathway to really transform decision-making Right now, the ratings too often flow through into ESG teams that love it or hate it are very separate from the investment teams. Um, they, they are um, tick boxes after a deal is done. They are not like core to decision making. And so this is where we need to bring better data, better tools into this space. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more with that comment. Thank you, Paloma and Ashby. I now want to come to Rashida Bob. Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I tend to speak fast, but I will put my information in the chat. Um, my name is Rashida Bob. I represent my advisory firm called Bricks Health. My focus area is digital health and investment. So I help um, invest, scale digital health, digital therapeutic companies in the market. Uh, my question is this, my background is in originally corporate investment. I've also done work in VC. And I've noticed two trends that's being that's lacking in the diversity of venture capital in the US and globally. I think globally, I live both in Europe and Africa. One of them is I'm noticing a lack of bringing operators 
that are or tend to, I've noticed when you're looking for diverse partners and leaders, and I'm naming diversity as women and underestimated people of color, unrepresented, so Black and Latinx people. I noticed that um, they tend to have um, backgrounds that are more in operation and finance, and then they move into the industry. So one thing I'm trying to do is trying to bring more operator leaders as angel investors, syndicates, and then partners of venture firms or LPs. And I'm very interested if any of the experts or all of the guests have any um, resources, people I should speak to that have similar um, initiatives. I'm working with a group called Medcetera, and I'll go one of this is an example. Our goal is to get physicians, physician leaders as LPs, um, advisors, and then investors and healthcare companies. Really simple kind of goal, and I'll focus on women of color. Um, so that's, I guess, my first question. And the second one, sorry to take so much time, um, Africa. We're talking about ESG. Um, I do work with two different um, investment firms in Africa that inv Africans invest in Africa. And I'm really curious to connect with anyone who has expertise in that area or willing to partner with um, investment um, firms that are focused on Africa that have ESG values and want to bring them into the larger innovation venture capital space. Two different topics. Um, let me know if I should reiterate either of them or clarify. Thank you, Rashida. Do any of the speakers want to respond to that? Uh, Miriam, yes, please come in. Hi. I was trying to unmute, but then I couldn't do it. Um, so in terms of your question related to um, capital going into companies as angels, uh, this is actually a pretty emerging area where um, we do see groups that are starting as um, angel groups that are focused on women, uh, people of color. And it's interesting, but that's kind of a new thing. I, I, one of the things that is really shocking to me, I guess, about um, capital is that it's really the most segregated field I've ever encountered. <laughs> you know, and I worked as a lawyer, I worked as a deal maker, I worked in technology, um, but I, the capital access issue is, is really huge. Um, so some of the different um, things that I think uh, I would recommend, like for example, Acumen Fund America is, um, very much focused on poverty in America as and the use of technology to help address poverty. So people who want to make um, social impact investments might consider that as um, a place for their philanthropy. Um, they are working in uh, investing in for-profit companies. About half of those companies are led by African-American and uh, Latino founders, um, huge percentage by women. And so uh, those uh, folks are very much involved in areas like health that are of particular concern to people of color. Um, the same thing would be true for village capital is another um, area where um, people can invest in areas like education and health. Um, and it works on a very different principle where the entrepreneurs themselves are part of the decision making about who in a cohort actually gets access to funding. Um, and so uh, you know, I think the the thing would be to either um, start uh, angel groups for African American uh, underrepresented minorities. I know there's one that recently got started in Chicago for Latinx, but I'm just saying it's like green space because there's not a lot happening. I wanted to um, come in um, for a minute and invite Keith Coleman to bring in perspectives from his world of Hollywood on ESG. Keith is um, co-president uh, or one of the founders of the so Southern California chapter of Stanford Angels and he's with us today. Um, Keith, over to you to just come in for very quick um, comments on what you see in your world. Danny, could you put the spotlight on Keith Coleman? He's ready to come in. Thank you. Um, now I'm muted. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much, Radhika. Um, and uh, this is a, a really powerful convening of folks. And um, I appreciate being uh, being with everyone. 
Um, you know, Miriam just described a very interesting comment in the breadth of her ex professional experience, you know, having been in law, deal making, and et cetera, but making the comment that in, in the capital field and finance that it was the most segregated field. Interestingly enough, some could say that um, the annals of entertainment, a very similar kind of a pedigree in terms of finance, in terms of gatekeepers and lack of access in some respects. And yet one differential in terms of the entertainment space is its power of storytelling. And, and in that, I think that uh, those that are focused in on a social impact, social innovation, social enterprise, and the ESGs, they really utilize uh, Hollywood and utilize that apparatus of storytelling in a much more um, directed and strategic way to push for the very values and changes uh, that Ashby was speaking to and Radhika, uh, Miriam and others. So I think that we want to uh, formulate a much more definitive relationship with, uh, with Hollywood and, and the different aspects and channels in Hollywood, whether it's the CAAs, the endeavors, uh, as well as the large entertainment firms themselves uh, and the celebrities to really push this EH, ESG mandate and the other mandates that we're speaking of um, to bring more direct uh, 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 influence uh, to bear. Um, you know, one element of storytelling, as we all know, that's very, very powerful is it helps people to suspend their disbelief. Uh, and from a therapeutic perspective, everyone, many uh, may have watched Ted Lasso uh, and not really recognize that inside of Ted Lasso, there was baked in a lot of directed therapeutic work in terms of uh, positive psychology and things related to counseling practices. And yet it was told through a storyline that allowed people to, uh, to ingest it and be open to that, um, differently so than if they were, let's say, going to spend time in a therapeutic uh, couch or a counseling position. And so what I mean by that is, is that storytelling and entertainment and that medium I think could be a very valuable resource and ally uh, to the, the ESG and the social impact and social uh, SDG uh, movement uh, in a manner which legislative attempts um, may, may fall by the wayside. So I think that we really want to look at uh, that kind of element. And we're doing that uh, down here in Southern California with Stanford Angels SoCal uh, with our uh, recognition of that and with our relationships with folks inside that space. So I hope that we can we can be a part of that with all the folks on this call is to really sort of define this movement and, and use storytelling in Hollywood uh, to help us do so. Thank you. Thank you for bringing the Hollywood perspective. Um, another quick perspective uh, from one of our other Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs co-founders, um, uh, board chair from Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs India. Um, Paula, if you're um, online right now, I think you are, I saw a message from you. Would you um, bring in a quick uh, one minute perspective from India? I know you have many chapters and you guys are very active there and doing a lot of work in ESG. And Paula herself is a leading impact investor as well in India. Um, Danny, can you put the spotlight on Paula Mariwala? Hi. <clears throat> Hi, Radhika, and uh, uh, great convening. Uh, good to see people like Miriam, uh, Ashby, and BHRCC making uh, really impactful uh, and insightful observations. Um, I mean, I, I can't agree with, uh, with the whole topic more. It's a really global issue. Um, we as investors um, uh, sometimes don't seem to really integrate the whole um, uh, ESG framework, or even uh, uh, you know, a, a true framework for inclu inclusivity, into the things that we do. And uh, like I said, it's I think it's a very global issue. Um, so access to capital is, is a very important thing, and we as VCs are really solving this, and we are giving access to entrepreneurs who are out there to make an impact. I think every entrepreneur, by and large, makes an impact. And in countries like uh, uh, you know India, Africa, and many other parts, uh, we play a very important role. 
However, I think, uh, uh, you know, there is definitely a, a very sharp distinction between, and it somehow seems to be increasing between what we're calling mainstream VCs and impact funds. Um, and really we need to bridge this divide. Uh, and I think some of the larger uh, uh, voices in the ecosystem can take the lead maybe to see how this can be done without compromising on uh, either giving good access to capital and giving good returns to the investors. So, um, uh, I mean, this is just an observation and, and supporting the whole importance of the topic that uh, Stanford Angels has brought out uh, along with PHRCC in this kind of a forum. But my broad question is, is there anything one can do? Because obviously it's not something that regulations can push. Uh, LPs can certainly push, but again, there seems to be a different color to the capital that goes in different kinds of funds. Uh, and, and Keith brought out some great ideas about how using storytelling and role models. Uh, and that has been effective, particularly where ESG is concerned. Uh, are there any other thoughts on how as VCs or as early stage investors or even uh, you know, founders and serial entrepreneurs, how one can really amplify this messaging uh, to mainstream this kind of change into the VC ecosystem? Thank you, Paula, for that great question. And do any of the speakers want to comment, uh, comment on that, including this idea of would regulation be useful in any way? Yeah, shall I, can I jump in? Please do, Phil. Yes, thanks very much for that. That's a great uh, roundup, really. I, I think the first thing I'd say is that you're, uh, we believe strongly that regulatory uh, efforts can make a significant difference. And we're seeing now governments stepping up to say, well, we need to ensure that government can set the framework in which Invest, investment can make a substantial difference and make the price, the price signals and the market signals reorientate in order to avoid those externalities that have become part of our business as, as usual in terms of investment. The externalities where effectively companies have been allowed to ex, externalize their environmental costs through pollution and of course through CO2 emissions that is leading now to our climate breakdown, as well as the social costs in, in terms of often, for instance, in the gig economy, the, the misclassification of workers. So all those efforts by governments, we believe can make a significant difference, but it has to be accompanied by a, a, other major actors. And of course, the other major actors are the investors, as uh, my other speakers have, uh, have, have, have addressed. And that the investors can play a fundamentally important role, but as Ashby and, uh, and Marion were really emphasizing, it's the issue of being informed about the human rights risks and the environmental risks that are likely to be uh, created unless mitigation and preventive measures are taken. And that's the real opportunity. Now, I think there's, we're demonstrating now how benchmarks and the key criteria that allow investors to make those uh, fine judgments, those sophisticated judgments, to identify the salient risks in a supply chain, they're coming through much more strongly. I'll give you just one example very briefly, but in the fast and fair transition that we need, for instance, um, across the world towards clean energy, we've already got massive need for investment, particularly in Africa, Latin America and Southeast Asia towards clean energy. And yet we're not getting that investment. But where it happens, unfortunately, it's not happening in a way which is respecting community rights, the right, their rights to land, indigenous people's rights, Afro descendants rights to their land and their, and their clean environment. And so we're ending up with investments coming in that are potentially creating a, a clean energy future but are destroying livelihoods and communities at the same time. So that's where, for instance, those key criteria that need to be developed to identify those risks can really help enormously in investors avoiding those, uh, avoiding those risks to communities and workers, as well as, of course, the reputation risks and the risk to cost because those, the protests and the blockades 
and the suspensions that come with it are extraordinarily costly, costly to the investors themselves. Thank you, Phil. And Ashby, do you want to come in with a few reflections? Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks for unmuting me too. I'm starting to have a panic attack. I keep hitting the button and I can't get in. Um, two, two quick comments, one, one from the chat and then one in terms of regulation. Um, interestingly, the SEC today in a, in a vote of three to one has voted to start to impose more reporting on, on large larger private equity and hedge funds, which I think is a really useful start. Like, these aren't alternative investments anymore. They are making up in the case of some asset owners, more than 50% of their portfolios. When you look at venture capital, hedge fund, private equity, you know, all these kinds of things. Like the alternative investments are almost the public equities and fixed income if you're looking at an endowment or something like this. So we're gonna need reporting standards. And I don't think it, we need to impose what investors do with that reporting, as in, if you have this, then you must, you know, change your asset allocation, but just the act of capturing more data in these spaces, I think will drive change. The second quick, if I may, quick point, um, and it, I think it was Shu Dar Yao and, and Paloma who, who said this, that the VCs actually just don't even have an awareness of ESG. And I just wanted to point out, um, that's true. In fact, uh, uh, another story I read yesterday on pensions and investments was a report that came out that VC investors, they did a survey of a hundred of them, and they said they didn't have the resources or interest um, to do ESG ratings of their portfolio. And I think there's, it, it goes beyond resources. I think there's an alignment between what ESG is. Um, I often see ESG in the lens of, of time and directionality. So ESG and impact investing are, in my mind, ESG comes before an investment, and impact is sort of like the outcome and investment, right? The directionality piece is ESG is what am I exposed to in the world? What, what is the world doing out there that's affecting my portfolio? And impact is what is my portfolio doing to the world? Very tiny differences in language, but really fundamentally important. You won't find very many asset owner investors on earth measuring the second thing. What is my portfolio doing to the world? New Zealand Super Fund is the very first fund I've seen in the last six months to say, you know what, we care what our portfolio is doing to the world rather than just trying to assess, you know, how much carbon intensity our portfolio has in it. I think venture capital, just by the nature of the investment strategy, aligns far greater with the outcomes and impact frameworks. What is this portfolio going to do to the world? rather than just that pure ESG, what am I exposed to? And so as we think about how we build data requirements for venture capital, focusing on the latter, the, those outcomes and the impact may be a more natural way of assessing and managing venture capital. Thank you, Ashby. We are going to have a second portion to the discussion quite a section. So Andreas and Kirsty, I want to just say I see you. Um, and we have two special guests we're going to introduce next just to share some reflections. And then we'll come back around. But Miriam, I see that you also want to comment on this question. So please come in. Yeah, I, I definitely want to comment on this because this is something that as a, a small VC, we probably have about $200 million in assets under management um, across three funds currently. And I think we're probably the largest Latin X woman led fund in the entire United States at that level. Um, so one is um, when we, uh, we often, we don't go to market as an impact fund. And part of it is um, not having the kind of resources that are traditionally um, expected in terms of ESG investment. Um, and one of the things that we often get are for people who are um, focused on ESG investing is um, a huge list of data requirements and data gathering requirements that are expected um, for people who receive um, impact funds. And in one case, for example, um, they were asking for so much um, reporting that it would have really been several months a year of data gathering to answer the questions from just this one LP. Um, and 
the impact fund would put in like a fifth of what their non-impact fund would put into um, Ulu Ventures. And I think that when we've tried to look at um, impact, a lot of the ESG measurements are so focused on what I think public companies um, reporting is about. So you see, um, you know, why a oil company could end up being a, a good ESG investment in the public markets because they can, you know, gather a ton of data about different efforts that they have going on. And, you know, the average size of a company at our stage is two people um, that are trying to uh, be able to raise capital in 18 months and have a significant um, impact in terms of uh, building a business. And most of them have, um, you know, apart from the fact that they run on computers, have very little um, negative impacts. Um, so it's very difficult for a small fund to be asking companies to do the level of reporting that is traditionally associated with impact investors trying to push down into venture capital um, a set of expectations that seem to have been created around public companies. So that's one thing about data. I, I think that, you know, what we tend to look at is how these companies can actually make a difference in terms of, you know, for example, they can, we think they can actually build a technology that will not use cobalt. Um, and that will um, have a lot of uh, positive environmental benefits or they can actually um, uh, create buses uh, that can compete with um, buses out of China that are also electric and or hydrogen fuel buses. So, you know, I think part of the, um, expectations around data tend not to be proportionate to um, early stage. And I think that's that's bad because I think that a lot of these founders are amongst the most idealistic of all people um, that are trying to actually make a difference through the work that they do. Thank you. Uh, and I want to come to Keith Coleman, who just has a brief response to that, and then we're going to transition to the next speaker. Uh, interesting enough, as, as Miriam was just describing about the proportionality of data versus those public companies versus uh, startups, um, and as Ashley was describing the, the difference between perhaps exposure versus impact, you know, the, the marketplace is really recognizing challenges with larger firms not um, manifesting, uh, you know, positive strategy related to ESGs with activist investors, uh, you, know, you know, what comes to mind, I guess, is uh, William Ackerman Pershing and, and, and other activist investors that are really looking at these public companies and whether or not their ESGs are in line because of potential future exposure, which, you know, may reduce uh, their profitability and, and, and cause these uh, 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 activist shareholders to, to rise up in that way. So, Perhaps uh, you know there there could be a, a lessening of this 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 data for startups because we're seeing that that effect uh, on a, a much larger scale with these activist shareholders pushing for ESG um, implementation uh, for larger firms as it relates to this is social energy and social innovation itself. And I do recall some years ago having been at a number of different uh, private equity uh, type of conferences. And unfortunately, when, when folks uh, finished talking about uh, other uh, avenues of investment, when it came to the social impact or social enterprise uh, arena, um, uh, they were all went on the panel. And uh, as many on this call recognize for many, many years, the idea of social uh, innovation, social impact, was looked in a more charitable type of a fashion. And I dare say that in this particular case, when all the women were on that panel, as though it was not real business and that it was women's work. And so this underlying kind of sense of bias, uh, which also was related to the Stanford work in terms of investment bias, this bias about social impact, I think is still there uh, in, a, in a gender fashion. And I think we also want to, uh, to review uh, and continue ways to make sure that, that those kinds of microaggressions and biases don't continue to affect the, this movement towards ESG for startups. 
thank you, Keith, and thank you all for your many insights. It's clear that we could go on further with the discussion, and we do want to loop back around to that. Um, but we do have two other special guests joining us. And so we first want to turn to Rani Saad, co-founder of Stanford Angels of the UK, who's going to share some perspectives with us. Rani has built and invested in ventures for over 25 years. In addition to being co-founder of Stanford Angels of the UK, also co-founder of Apex Black, a deep tech investment partnership. And he advises a multi-billion family office on VC investments. He's helped to launch two VC funds and co-founded and co led four startups in Silicon Valley, London, and elsewhere. He's also released products globally, directed innovation acceleration at Microsoft, launched one of the first fintech platforms in the US at Capital One, and led venture formation at Ideas42, a leading behavioral sciences entity. So Rani, I'll now turn it over to you to share your comments. Hi, uh, thank you very much, Kristen. Uh, I actually had some comments, but they were brought up. Maybe what I could do is just bring up two specific questions that we're trying to deal with in the early stage space, uh, and they sort of dovetail into some other comments. Um, I, I do want to point out that there are a couple of frameworks uh, that have been produced by a collective uh, of, uh, by two collectives, by a couple of collectives of VC funds to try to start reporting on ESG, uh, but they do uh, need more work. Uh, there is also a lack of standardization and most of it is voluntary. It is driven by LPs to a large extent in many instances. Uh, I have seen, this, similar to what Miriam mentioned, I have seen ventures that actually care a lot about impact, uh, positive impact on the world. Uh, choosing non-ESG or non-impact investors to reduce the burden or the tax of reporting. So the two questions that uh, are top of my mind and was, you know, in, in, in discussions that I've had recently on this is A, uh, how do we avoid the topic of ESG and potentially, you know, the externalities uh, to become a topic of compliance and reporting only? Uh, but actually to make it uh, or, or, you know, escalate the commitment into it as a force for good. In other words, how do we make it intrinsically motivating? How do we make it clear that this is uh, correlated with other goals of success for the business, be them profitability, be them, you know, attracting talent, et cetera. Uh, early indications, early studies have shown very high correlations, uh, but I think we need to work more on this. Uh, also, the other big question in my mind uh, and in discussions we've had was around understanding where the centers of gravity or the spheres of influence, maybe is the better way of saying it, in the space are. So, you know, here in the discussion, I've heard that, you know, regulatory could be um, one area of, of, of influence. I'm actually not a big fan of having it purely top down because it does end up uh, potentially becoming a reporting tool and a compliance tool. Um, other spheres of influence are obviously are the LPs, but also the GPs and the funds. But I think the most important are the entrepreneurs themselves, the ventures, by proving those that are aligned with you know positive externalities and um, uh, sort of ESG goals, uh, proving business success. You know, obviously, you know, there are very big headlines around this, such as, you know, what, you know, Elon Musk was able to do with electric vehicles and so on. But I mean, that's sort of an example of, you know, having some sort of entrepreneurial push whereby, you know, the, the two sets of goals are aligned and they're proven to be uh, correlated would be, you know, potentially a, a very positive sphere of influence. So, you know, A, you know, how do we avoid it becoming a compliance and reporting uh, situation? And B, uh, how can we think a little bit more about the spheres of influence and how they can work together in a, in a more uh, sort of virtual cycle um, to achieve these results. 
that's uh, that's all I I had to share. I, there were more questions than uh, than anything else. Uh, and thanks a lot for the opportunity to uh, contribute. Thank you so much, Ronnie, and thank you for leaving us with those big questions that I hope we can delve into a little bit with the remaining time we have left. I now want to turn to Michael Kleinman. Michael is the Director of Technology and Human Rights at Amnesty International USA, where he leads their work in Silicon Valley, including research and advocacy on the importance of human rights due diligence by VC firms. Previously, Michael was a founder and CEO of Orange Door Research, which helped donors, NGOs, and UN agencies gather data in conflict-affected countries, and prior to that, was Director of Investments at Humanity United. Michael, thank you for joining us and looking forward to hearing your comments. Thank you so much, and thank you for, for having me, and I will be, be brief. I'm just going to do a deep dive on one aspect of ESG that has been brought up, and that's human rights due diligence. We released a report a few months ago looking at VC firms and human rights due diligence, and we found, perhaps not surprisingly, that the largest VC funds operate with little consideration around the broader human rights impacts of their investment decisions. As set forth in the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, Companies and investors have a responsibility to respect all human rights in their operations. This means specifically that investors, including VCs, must undertake human rights due diligence. That means they must undertake proactive and ongoing steps to identify, mitigate, and account for the human rights impacts of their investments. For this report, we surveyed 50 of the largest VC firms, according to the VCJ50 list, as well as three leading startup accelerators. And of those 53 firms and accelerators that we surveyed, one had a human rights due diligence policy that met the standards set forth in the UN guiding principles. An additional eight had a policy, though it didn't meet the minimum standards set forth in the guiding principles. Overall, 83% of the firms and accelerators that we surveyed and researched, we couldn't find any evidence of a human rights due diligence policy or practices that they were undertaking. Now, this has three significant consequences. First of all, it means that VC firms are more likely to invest in companies that themselves are directly implicated in human rights abuses. For instance, investments that leading VC firms have made in surveillance tech firms, in surveillance tech companies that are implicated in Chinese repression in Xinjiang. We also just heard, there's a recent report in Haaretz newspaper in Israel, that a US VC firm is considering an investment in NSO Group, which was in the news a lot over the last few months for the spyware that it produces that's been used to hack into the accounts of activists, human rights defenders, journalists, and politicians. Second, a lack of human rights due diligence means that VC firms are much more likely to support business models that have a significant negative impact on human rights. And in particular, here we're looking at some of the gig economy business models and their impact on labor rights. Third, and perhaps most concerning, is that a lack of human rights due diligence, and this gets to a point that Ashby raised around risk and understanding risk, means that VC firms are more likely to invest in new technologies or new applications of technologies without any understanding of the potential downstream risks that these technologies might have. And we're not saying that firms need to be able to look into a crystal ball and predict the future, but just as it's understood that before any large investment um, you have to do, investment that involves for physical infrastructure, you have to do an environmental impact assessment to at least try and understand the environmental impact of what that investment means, so too with investments across the whole range of sectors in which VCs operate, there needs to be a human rights impact assessment to at least try and understand what some of the downstream effects might be. 
And the lack of any attempt to do that, the lack of any attempt to carry out a human rights due diligence practice means that VC firms are not living up to the responsibility that they have to respect human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Michael, for bringing in those perspectives and um, the information from the report, which is very powerful. Um, next, um, I wanted to invite um, Jack Loveridge, who is um, co-president or, or a leader um, of the Stanford uh, Angels and Entrepreneurs um, Club of Texas. He can bring in the perspectives from Texas as well as part of the Paris Peace Forum and very involved in the work of human rights and peace building as well. And um, welcome, Jack. Thank you very much, Radhika, and thank you to um, all of the speakers and participants. This is an incredibly important uh, discussion that we're having today, and I'm just very happy to be a part of it. Um, here in Texas, we've recently founded um, a branch of Stanford a &E, um, that is focused on the very significant changes that have occurred within the state economy over the past uh, five to 10 years. Um, everybody's aware of uh, what We've seen in Austin the positive and negative effects of uh, the moves of uh, large companies from Silicon Valley uh, to the Lone Star State. Um, but I think fewer people are aware of what's going on um, in the context of the Texas-Mexico border, uh, how businesses are uh, entering uh, our local economies and how local uh, investment uh, is really poised to take off. And so our chapter is dedicated toward uh, having Stanford be a part of these uh, changes in Texas and promoting uh, sustainability and promoting a connection to uh, both the broader uh, landscape in Silicon Valley, but also globally. Uh, we'd very much like our chapter to be as involved as possible with uh, developments in uh, Latin America. Uh, I, I'm based in El Paso, Texas. I have family on both sides of the border. And so these issues are very critical. Um, in thinking about Texas, not just as uh, this sort of refuge of uh, Silicon Valley uh, of investors who are, are, are seeking a, a less regulatory uh, onerous space, but a community that really has a lot to offer. Um, I also work uh, through the Paris Peace Forum on a project that I founded uh, two years ago called Initiate Digital Rights in Society. And so a lot of the suggestions that have come out of this conversation really do resonate. Uh, our focus is on uh, algorithmic governance, governance issues um, along the global north-south divide. And so we've focused on um, AI in particular and our working groups um, of, of experts across the global south have been uh, putting together several reports uh, which are due out in the next few weeks and months um, on these uh, critical issues, how AI can be used for uh, achieving sustainable development purposes, and also the risks of abuse um, on, on the global level. Um, a couple of things that came to mind, uh, just as suggestions, the Paris Peace Forum works with the World Benchmarking Alliance. Um, I believe Paloma had suggested um, some kind of VC uh, standards uh, that could be launched at the global level. Uh, that would be a good venue uh, through which to uh, facilitate that. Uh, secondly, uh, the Paris Peace Forum also helps to incubate um, AI, AI work uh, through the OECD and previously on UNESCO. And so there are these tremendous opportunities at the global level uh, to coordinate and, and to get VCs more involved in these uh, important regulatory discussions. So just thank you very much again for having um, this discussion and we look forward to uh, connecting Texas to the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack. Uh, so in our remaining uh, about 10 minutes, we are gonna come to three people for comments and questions. So uh, we'll start with my colleague, Danny, and then Andreas, we will come to you. 
and Kirsty come to you and then we'll go back to the speakers for just any final quick reflections on any of those questions. Um, and just great to see how much discussion there is and how we could continue this call for even longer. So it suggests we need a part two at least. Um, so I'm gonna come to my colleague, Danny Raymond. He is the technology and human rights researcher at the Business and Human Rights Resource Center based in Santiago. Um, Danny, over to you. Hi, thank you very much. I am really glad to have the opportunity to speak with all of you and also to hear all of your experience. I just want to mention that um, regarding to venture capital firms, at least in South America, we have seen in recent times that, and mainly since 2000, that uh, venture capital deals has been like increasing um, in, a, in a big way, right, in, in our region. But the thing that, despite of that, we're still hearing about how the, this economy has been uh, like being powered by different tech, in the tech industry. But we have also heard how the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean has argued that the poverty could increase 4.4%. Uh, that that means that it will be a hundred of million of people that will be under the line of poverty. And the thing is, why I'm referring to this, it is because we can see that we're going to see some industries that are growing, but despite of that, we're not seeing sometimes how that is also reflected in the growth of the SDG, right? So uh, I am really happy to have the opportunity to hear all these thoughts and also to invite venture capital firms and to speak with people that it's involved in this in, in this world, right? To how we can uh, encourage different um, different venture capital firms to, like Michael just said, uh, start to think about how we can, for example, do the dealings process and also try to uh, think about human rights impact, environment uh, impacts as well. So that is, I think it's, like an invitation for everyone here to start to work on that. And I think that many of the people, and I think reading the chat, we can say that almost everybody has been talking about how we can go farther, farther with this idea, right? So thank you very much for this um, time. And it has been an honor to be here with all of you. Thank you very much, Danny. Um, and thank you for all of your work to co-organize this event as well. Andreas, I'll come to you and thank you for your patience. Hi, uh, my name is Andreas Schluter. I'm a postdoc at Stanford and a co-founder of a startup in Africa that fights hunger by linking food surplus and deficit regions. I have a fairly fundamental question uh, I've been struggling with in the past months and haven't found a satisfying answer uh, to yet, so I would be very happy to get some feedback from the panel. Um, the basis of venture capital uh, capitalism is the power law distribution, meaning that there are only very few winners that will bring the um, largest part of the return in the portfolio and will take the largest share of the cake. So maybe in 20, 30 years, there will be only like a few huge companies uh, left that concentrate most of the wealth and power. And we already see like huge societal uh, issues with the concentration of power at the fan companies. And even though venture capitalism leads to a net benefit uh, to the society, we need to be careful not to exacerbate uh, current inequalities and concentrate power on very few um, players that could threaten societal peace. So uh, my question is, like, how can we make sure that venture capitalism in the SDG space will not lead to more inequality, concentrating assets in the hands of very few? And is it just an inherent problem to venture capitalism that, that can't be solved, that's just part of the, the game? And what are uh, models uh, you know or you work with? Um, so a less privileged uh, part of the society, for example, in our case, smallholder farmers can also participate in the creation of wealth and power. And how can venture capitalism help to avoid uh, drifting towards a tech dictatorship and protect democracy? Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. That's a great, uh, great question. Christy. Okay, Kristen, great, thank you. Gosh, well, I wish I could answer Andreas's question because then I think we'd be like, wow, great, we might have solved this. So gosh, what a great one to post. Um, I'm really happy to be here, gonna offer one quick comment. I'm Kirsty Jenkinson, I lead um, the Sustainable Investment 
um, portfolio and unit at CalSTRS, the California State Teachers Retirement System, so one of those big asset owners that Ashby was talking about. Um, and I'm also on the board of the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, so amazing to see this um, grouping together. I guess my comment reflects on actually one of the discussion we were having in the earlier section. So forgive me if I'm sort of going back to that, but it's really just a kind of an encouragement for all of us. I see the is a real shift happening between the intersection of what I would call traditional impact investment communities, which traditionally might have not been so profit oriented, but were more impact focused and a convergent with the institutional investor community within which I sit. I sort of have come from both areas because I've worked um, with environmental entrepreneurs in emerging markets and trying to attract capital there at a sort of a smaller scale. And now I'm obviously working for a larger scale institutional investor. And in the last 10 years, I've, I've definitely seen this convergence happen between the two groups. But I think if we're really going to tackle some of the issues that we're talking about today, to try to find ways to continue to promote that convergence is really important. Um, I'm looking at it in, in very sort of um, simple ways. You know, there are groups that we are working with, like Impact Engine in Chicago, who is trying to sort of really bring together institutional investors and, and impact investments. You know, consulting firms like Tideline, I think, are doing a good job of trying to bridge this gap. Um, there's a gathering called the Climate Salon, which is was in here in San Francisco and then other places as well that tries to bring together these communities. And I even think about Impact Alpha that I read every morning and make my team read, you know, sort of, again, bridging that gap between impact and, and institutional investors. But I don't really see a lot of other networking areas or convergence where I can go to kind of meet some of the um, you know, firms that we've been talking about who can also play across the spectrum from sort of more boutique to, to sort of large institutional capital. So I was just hoping that we could kind of continue to sort of grow that because it would certainly help me as one of my roles is to build out a multi-asset class sustainability focused portfolio from the spectrum of you know, public equity all the way to sort of venture capital. And I'm really looking to do this in a way that we can demonstrate that it can be done from a large asset owner and can be done thoughtfully considering all of the impact issues that we've raised and the risks as well. So really happy to be here. It's been a great conversation. I find it so inspiring. Thank you so much, Kirsty. And now I, I have a challenge for the speakers, um, Miriam, Ashby and Phil, which is to in 30 seconds to maybe a minute, um, if you could each just share reflections on kind of some of the final questions, how to ensure VCs in SDG won't, le uh, won't lead to concentrating more power in the hands of the few. Uh, Ronnie posed a great question around how avoiding ESG just being a compliance and reporting only um, for VC firms. So any final reflections, and then we'll come to Radhika to close. And Miriam, I'll start with you. So I think this has just been really great, frankly, um, because I think a lot of the times most of us are probably um, speaking to the converted within our own areas. Um, and I think uh, for me, I feel like I've got a bunch of great um, references that people have uh, put forth uh, for me to read. Um, so I'm excited about uh, learning more about some of this research, for example, um, uh, that uh, I think Michael uh, talked about from Amnesty, for example. And, you know, I think, I think that this is what we need to do so that the people who are in the VC area um, that have this kind of ability to influence who has access to capital, what technologies create get created, um, that they're thinking about these issues. And, and I can say, you know, I don't, I, I have never gone to any VC oriented training and I have gone to uh, VC trainings that are run by the Rock Center and National Venture Capital Association and helped to start some of that like over, you know, eight years ago. I've never heard any of these topics come up in that setting. So the good thing is um, we can change that. And I'm excited to um, at least get this discussion going where VCs actually congregate because they're not congregating where you might be speaking, I don't think. Thank you, Ashby. 
needs to be unmuted. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Another panic attack there. Um, look, I, I think the key, it's an amazing moment, right? Like if we fast forward 10 years, I promise you the venture capital community won't be using spreadsheets and emails to, to manage their entire portfolio, which is sadly often the case. Maybe a few have decent platforms and tools, but for an industry that is dominated by investments in technology, technology has not yet permeated the operating model of venture capitalists. And that's going to change. And so that's the moment we have in front of us over the next 10 years to transform how they make decisions. The LPs, they can demand data. I actually think if they demand data and they force everybody to get a little bit more smart on data, that's an okay constraint. I understand small VCs and small companies, you know, maybe it's a resource too far. The bigger VCs don't have an excuse, you know. Um, Andreessen just raised $9 billion. Like you can't tell me they don't have the wherewithal to fund a project on this, especially if we will orient it towards impact rather than ESG and really try to model the future. This is the, the big project, modeling the future, making assumptions about investment strategies, beginning to think about what are the trade-offs, the scenarios, and, and then selecting the path we wanna go after. I think that's the exciting part. So um, with that, thanks for, thanks for involving me. Thank you so much, Ashby, for being here. Phil, final remarks. Thanks very much, yeah. As you say, Ashby, it's a key moment and there's an enormous opportunity for us to take here. So I'm very excited. Uh, just to answer a couple of the questions. I, I mean, Andreas, I think your question is fundamental. I do believe that there's space now to start thinking about not only co-benefit, in terms of the investment that goes into communities, but also co-ownership. And we're seeing some of that occasionally, for instance, in the renewable energy sector, where the indigenous communities bring their land and the investors bring the technology and together they can create through a co-ownership model, genuine co-benefit. And indeed for the indigenous nations, a sovereign wealth fund is being created for the long term, not just for their generation, but for the generations to come. And then just on those issues that, uh, that Rani raised and also Michael was raising about how to avoid compliance and reporting approach. You know, the last thing we need is a tick box exercise that comes in and people are just, uh, uh, are just ticking off the boxes and it really says nothing. And I think the key experience that we have working with investors and with uh, companies is that to do genuine due diligence in terms of identifying the salient risks and the positive impacts that are going to come to communities and workers. It really takes engagement with the workers and the communities themselves. They know where the risks are in supply chains and they're able to identify them and explain them really fully. So working with the companies, but also speaking to the other stakeholders in terms of the, the future is going to be a, a, a fundamental way in which due diligence comes alive and we can ensure that the investments that uh, must happen in our world, if we're going to get that fair and fast transition, if we're going to address unsustainable inequality, those investments that are going to be made really do deliver on the sustainable development goals and create a fine future of shared prosperity and shared security. Thank you, Phil, and thank you to all of the speakers at this event. I also want to draw attention to the chat, as I think folks have been putting in re relevant reports. Um, so just a reminder to check that. And with that, I will turn it over to Radhika for closing remarks. Thank you all, and we are so happy this was such an engaging discussion. Uh, on behalf of the dialogue co-conveners, we'd like to thank the speakers, the participants from around the world for sharing such diverse and rich insights in this inaugural dialogue of the series. Recognizing the gravity of this unique moment, our speakers touched on a range of topics, both at the industry ecosystem level, as well as case studies. We touched on the win-win effects of funding ESG and diverse teams, broad level risks and opportunities that tech offers, the impact of tech innovation and in doing investing in a responsible manner, the need to keep human rights front and center systems change that is needed, and to keep, an, uh, keep in mind the impact on climate change when making funding decisions. And above all, this being the moment for the VC community to seize, to embrace inclusive tech, human rights, diversity, play a role in advancing the SDGs. 
On next steps, we are planning a second dialogue on this theme in 2022. We will also be exploring the possibility of launching a study group or working group to brainstorm on the systems change needed in the industry so that those in the echelons of power can be major actors in advancing the sustainable development goals in this last decade of action. Friends, investor colleagues, fellow world citizens, in this moment of existential crisis for all humanity and our planet, we call on each and every one of you to do everything you can to help us shift towards more sustainable and equitable societies. The SDGs weave together solutions to economic, social, and environmental challenges of our times. We call on you to consider embracing them as a guiding North Star in everything you do. Whether you engage with this community, the UN, do something of your own within your community or industry. I'll wrap us up by sharing a quote from my role model, Mahatma Gandhi. The difference between what we do and what we are capable of doing would suffice to solve most of the world's problems. Thank you again for taking the time to join us today. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. And we will be seeing you all soon again. <laughs>